pray. Father, I pray today that as we study your word, as we kind of embrace a difficult topic today, Lord, that we would find the freedom that your word promises and that we would be able to live victoriously according to your truth. Now, Lord, open our eyes that we can see wonderful things in your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So blessed, blessed is an important Jesus word. We know that, right? It's, he uses it in the Sermon on the Mount. He introduces the nine Beatitudes that are found there with the word Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The, the blessed are those for whom the kingdom of God has come. The blessed are the ones that have been welcomed into the kingdom of God, which is the place where we experience his presence, his power, and his love. It's the blessed to whom the kingdom of God is now available. And that blessing that was spoken by Jesus is only available through Jesus. Okay, let me say that again. The blessing that was spoken by Jesus is only available through Jesus. It is a blessing that is available to the least of these. It's available to those that in our comfort we turn our backs on. Yet Jesus pronounces on them this blessing if they come to him in faith. In, in the second beatitude, the blessing is pronounced upon what I think is the most unlikely group of all. It's the people that, to be honest, we would rather avoid. It's, it's that group of people that we, we don't really know what to say to them. And so we, we try to avoid, if at all possible. In Matthew 5, 4, Jesus pronounced the second beatitude. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I want you to understand, perhaps most importantly, the blessing is not in the morning, it's for the morning. The blessing is not in the morning, it is for the morning. The blessing is in the comfort. The blessing is in the comfort that Jesus offers. Now, who was Jesus speaking to when he said, blessed are those who mourn, he was certainly thinking of people who experience loss. There's the loss of a loved one. There's the loss of homes, jobs, loss of health. All of those are legitimate losses. And there's no question that there were many in that great crowd on the Sermon on the Mount that were mourning because there are Many in any crowd that mourn. But in the same way last week that we said the poor in spirit of the first beatitude are, are those that Jesus looks beyond material poverty and deep into their soul. So those who mourn moves beyond those who are experiencing physical loss and it moves into the spiritual loss as well. Those who are grieving some loss in their spirit. So, so Jesus is necessarily addressing those who are knowingly suffering because of sin. 
their sin. And the loss is, it's the loss of innocence. It's the loss of purpose. It's the loss of faith. And sometimes, perhaps most tragically of all, it is the loss of hope. See, the mournful byproduct of sin is the loss of relational intimacy with God. It breaks our fellowship. And so, whether loss is triggered by the loss of a loved one, the mourning is triggered by the loss of a loved one, or it's triggered by a spiritual loss, God understands and we understand that it is a very painful place to be. And the fact is, it is a place that we would avoid if we could. And so if, if poor in spirit is the last thing we want to be, we have to agree that mourning is the last thing we want to do. Yet here is Jesus pronouncing a blessing on those who mourn, whether they're forced to go through it by some kind of loss in their circumstances, or they choose to go through it because... Because we recognize that mourning our spiritual condition can lead to our spiritual well-being. In either case, the presence of mourning can always be traced back to the detritus or the trash, the carnage of sin. See, I don't know if you've thought about it or not, but before sin, there was no mourning. It was the garden. There was nothing to mourn. There was the uninterrupted fellowship between God and His created. But after the fall, the infection of sin spread through our world like the plague, and it got all of us. And the scripture says that death became a natural part of this life because of sin. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Physically and spiritually, sin always leads to death. It is literally inescapable. We, we know it to be as sure as we know that loving, wise husbands made their way to see Downton Abbey this weekend. Right? I did. Death is a certainty. And so is the fact that it catapults us into mourning and ultimately compels us to seek comfort. And that's comfort that God wants to provide. You know, D David understood that. And that's why he declared that the Lord was his shepherd. And in that beautiful psalm, Psalm 23, in verse 4, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, my shepherd, are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, I think there can be no doubt that in this beatitude, Jesus is saying that the comfort that God provides is for the physical loss we experience because the wages of sin is literally death. But I think we also need to acknowledge that primarily, perhaps most importantly, Jesus is speaking not for the comfort that's offered for 
mourning the loss of sin, not exclusively. Not that we mourn what sin cost us, but rather, and this is so important to understand, Jesus is promising comfort for those who mourn the presence of sin. And those are two very different things. We, we mourn what we experience because of sin. But what Jesus is calling for and what he pronounces his blessing on is mourning because of the presence of sin. For believers, those who want to live victoriously in the kingdom of God, this is a mourning of choice. It's mourning that is the right response to the presence of sin in our world and certainly to the presence of sin in our hearts. It's the mourning that's described in Psalm 119, 136 when the psalmist wrote, Streams of tears flow from my eyes because your law is not obeyed. That's the morning that Jesus blesses. And it's the morning we avoid. How many of us ever go there? I think we might complain about sin. We certainly complain about other people's sins. We call them names. And we rail against them on social media and to whoever will listen. But rarely if ever does sin, and in particular ours, bring us to tears. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Why is it that we avoid just owning it? And I think we avoid this particular brand of mourning because it requires that we acknowledge that something's dark about us. That we, we have to acknowledge what we have trained ourselves to hide. We, we don't like the discipline of mourning our sin because it, it means that we have to transition from saying something's not right, something's broken, to the point where we say, I'm not right. I'm broken. And for some of us, if not all of us, that's a tall task. It's it's humiliating. And it should be. But just as Jesus pointed out, God provides a blessing, the blessing of comfort for those who are willing to go there, for those who choose to mourn the presence of sin in the world and in us. We, we read this passage a couple of weeks ago, but it, I, I thought about it again this week and it, it made me wonder, was James thinking about the second Beatitude when he wrote these words in James chapter 4 beginning in verse 8 he said come near to God and he will come near to you wash your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded grieve mourn and wail by choice Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And here's the blessing. 
and he will lift you up. What, what James is saying and what all the scripture from Genesis to Maps affirms, mourning our sin is a painful humiliation. But it is embracing that, humil- in embracing that humiliation that God meets us and lifts us up. I think when it comes to sin, what we are most faithful in is pointing it out in others. We climb up on our high horse and we judge. Matter of fact, we become judge and jury. We wag our fingers and we want to fix people. And all the while, what Scripture is calling us to, and if we have the courage to be still before God and listen, what His Spirit is drawing us to is to letting God in our hearts. We would say with David in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and try me, and see if there be any offensive way in me, and then lead me to the way everlasting. It's our sin we need to mourn. So we say, okay, all right, I've got it. I know there's some benefit. I, I, I really want to experience the, the comfort and the, the presence of God. So even though I've got a whole lot to mourn, I'm, I'm willing to go there. But like, where do I start? I'm, I'm not even sure I know how. I know that I can't say with the psalmist that streams of tears flow from my eyes because his law is not obeyed. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm not there emotionally. Where do I start? Because like I spend my time looking around at other people who are so messed up that I feel really good about where I am anyway. And then we become like the... The religious leader in the temple that we looked at last week who said, God, I'm so thankful that that I'm not like these other people around here that are so messed up. So where do we start? Well, to begin with, I, I, I think this is really simple. We have to begin by ceasing to call sins mistakes. Okay, that's easy enough, right? We can warm up to this concept. I'm going to stop calling sins mistakes. Those two things are different and we know it. But as Andy Stanley says, that's why we do it. That's why we call sins mistakes. Because we want to be found guilty of mistakes rather than guilty of sin. We want our sins to be mistakes because we can manage mistakes. Right? A mistake is a goof up, it's an error, it's a miscalculation, it's a wrong turn. It's not leaving early enough. It's it's things that we regret. It's something that we apologize for. And we might even try to make amends for a mistake, but... But here, here's why we like mistakes more than sins. Is we know that mourning is not called for. We don't have to mourn mistakes. As a matter of fact, if you mourn mistakes, you're, you might be in an unhealthy place dealing with 
shame and unhealthy shame. Because what we mourn is sin. It, it, sin is a fundamental flaw in our character that compels us to think or do or, or, or say things that unleash destruction. Sin is a, it's a skew in our spirit that consistently takes us in the wrong direction. For instance, we were made to be generous, but we tend toward greed. We were designed to treasure our sexuality, but we trash it. We were wired to worship God. Instead, we worship cars, homes, success, nature, or ourselves. These are not just mistakes. These are sins. And whether the world likes to talk about it or not, God talks about it in his word. And it is our responsibility to understand what he says. And here's what he says. We are not just mistakers. We are all of us sinners. None of us is, is exempt. All have sinned and do sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so to mourn this reality is to face the truth about ourselves and the world and the truth is, we are messed up people and we live on a messed up planet. Now, that might not be good news, but it ain't fake news either. It's true. And we, we typically avoid these things because it doesn't make us feel good. And we want to be an, a, an assembly of encouragement and joy. But here, here's what we need to understand. Sometimes we have to go through the difficult stuff to get to the joy and the comfort that God wants us to live with. When we finally realize... When we finally admit that, that we are sinners and not just mistakers. We've taken the first step toward mourning. We have owned who we are. Apart from Christ. And we've owned the fact that we need Him. We need His forgiveness. We need his comfort. And so we've taken the first step to receiving the blessing of God's comfort. So we need to acknowledge that we don't just make mistakes. We sin. And then the second thing we need to do, and it's really simple, but not easy. We need to abandon the process of sin management. See, the, the exhortation is to mourn sin, not manage it. Now, when we manage sin, what we're really trying to do is mitigate its consequences. We're, we're, we're working diligently to lessen its blow. We're manipulating circumstances so that the, the pain that is caused by our sin to us or those we love is minimized. We, we want to minimize sin's damages. But managing sins means that we, we aren't acknowledging the problem of sin itself only its consequences. We're, we're only addressing what happens because of sin, not the issue of sin. 
So for instance, I work to manage what comes out of my mouth. Now, instead of addressing the, the sinful anger that causes my mouth to erupt like a volcano. You see what I'm saying? We, we regret what we did or what we said and we vow that we're never going to go there again. But we will always return until we mourn the sin that, it's, that is at the heart. Of our behavior. So when, I'm, I'm, when I say I'm not going to yell again. I'm managing sin. When I turn to God for forgiveness and help with my anger. I'm mourning it. And there's a big difference. Managing sin is a fruitless endeavor. Because we can't control it. That's why we need Jesus. That's why he died on the cross. To forgive us our sins. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And provide for us a path to righteousness. I, I find it ironic. When... We condemn others for sins in their lives that they can't control. Because the fact is, none of us on our own can control sin. We need help. The difference between mourning sin and managing sin can easily be seen when we compare two very public sins of the first two kings of Israel. One of the kings managed his sin, the first one, and the other one mourned it, the second one. The manager, you guys probably know the first king of Israel, his name was Saul. He managed his sin. The, the story plays out in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and you can just jot that down. Don't turn there. Actually, we're going to look at another passage of Scripture in just a few moments. But the, the story unfolds in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And here's what happened. God had a spokesman on the scene. His name was Samuel. Samuel was actually the one who anointed uh, King Saul. And God went to Samuel and said, Samuel, I want you to go see Saul and give him some orders uh, for battle. He is to round up all the troops in Israel and then he's going to go on the offensive against the Amalekites. And here are the rules. Destroy everything. Now we, we're uncomfortable with that, but that's what he was told. Saul and his armies should destroy everything. Now the reason is if you go back into the history back into the book of Exodus, Amalek was the, the first nation to attack Israel after God freed her from slavery in Egypt. So they head through the Red Sea, they're moving toward the Promised Land, and the, the, the Amalekites decide, for whatever reason, that they're going to pick a fight with the Israelites. And you, you'll probably remember this battle if you know your Old Testament history because this is the one where Moses said, Joshua, I want you to gather the troops and I want you to go down there on the battlefield and fight the Amalekites. And then Moses and two other guys uh, climbed to the top of a hill where they could have a view of the fighting. And what Moses found up there on the top of that hill was that as long as he held his hands up and his staff toward God, that Joshua and the Israelites were were winning the battle. 
But then when Moses got tired and he dropped his arms, the Amalekites seized control. So Moses looked at those two guys beside him and said, Guys, hold my arms up. And that's what they did. And as Moses held his arms up to God, Joshua and the, the battle, the soldiers of Israel defeated the Amalekites. And then when the battle was over, God said, Listen, Moses, I want you to write this down. I want you to write down exactly what happened. And then I want you to mark my words. And you know what it means when, when your, your parents, when my dad said to me, mark my words, it was a promise. This is going to happen. Mark my words. God said, mark my words. I will utterly destroy the Amalekites. I will erase them. For what they've done. Now we fast forward to King Saul. And God's going to keep his promises. And the assignment goes to Saul. Saul. Gather up an army. And destroy the Amalekites. Well. That's what he did. Kind of. Instead of following, Saul got the armies up. They went to battle. They mostly destroyed the Amalekites. But instead of following God's command so God could keep his promises, Saul and his crew thought, you know, we have a better idea. Surely, God didn't really mean destroy everything because those people have some things of value. And so Saul and the armies destroyed the people and they destroyed worthless stuff. But they preserved some things that they could use for their benefit. They preserved the things of value. Now, as you might imagine, God was none too happy about this. So he went back to see Samuel and he said, Samuel, I want you to go to Saul and I want you to call him out for what he did. And that's what Samuel did. He approached Saul and said, why in the world did you choose to disobey God? And, and Saul said, no, 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 we, we didn't disobey. We, we did just about everything he told us to do. And then Samuel asked the question that I love. In 1 Samuel 15, 14, Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? In other words, if you did what God told you to do, why are there so many sheep and oxen hanging around? And Samuel went on to announce that because of Saul's disobedience, God was going to take the kingdom away from him. And his family would ultimately, at some point in the future, Saul's family was going to lose the throne to another man, another family, a man after God's own heart. And so Saul immediately jumped in and he began to spin it. And, and he said, oh, okay, I admit this was sin. It, it, it really was more than a mistake, but, but, but it's something we need to overlook. As a matter of fact, it, it's really more what the people did. They were the ones who disobeyed. I, gave them, I told them what God said, and then they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. But Samuel held the line. He held the line and said, no, Saul, this is your sin. This is your sin. And, and Saul changed his tone, and he said, okay, it, it is sin, but it's a really small one, and it needs to be overlooked because, because we got most of it right. We almost did everything God told us to do. And we just need to move past it. The good of the nation of Israel is at stake here. And then Saul gave the clincher in 1 Samuel 15.30. He said, okay, I have sinned, but please, 
Honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship God. And, and okay, in other words, he said, okay, okay, you're right. I was wrong. I should have done what God said. But, and, and I'll, I accept the consequences. God's going to make a, a change. But right now, right now, can we just kind of keep things the way they are? Like, let's don't, let's don't make a big to-do out of this. Let's just keep things status quo. And you just honor me before the elders and they'll know we're on the same page. And you know what he was doing? Sin management. He was practicing sin management. He had regret, but that was only because he got caught. He dreaded the consequences of his mistake, but he wasn't owning it. He, he wasn't heartbroken that he had disobeyed God or, or that he thought he knew better than God or that he had better ideas than God. If, if Saul could just manage the sin, if he could maintain his image and his power and his glory, in his mind everything would be okay. And there was never any thought to the damage that his sin did to the glory of God. What it did to his great name. That's what sin management does. Saul was a sin manager. And in the end, he lost his kingdom. The kingdom he was so desperately trying to protect. Now we fast forward to the second king of Israel, David. His trouble began when the scripture says it was the, in the spring of the year when all the kings go out to war, David chose to stay home. And in his boredom, he one morning he climbed up onto the rooftop of his palace where he could see all the kingdom that God had entrusted to his care. And while he was up there, unfortunately for everyone, David caught sight of his friend Uriah's wife. And she was bathing in the courtyard of her home and David in that moment in his boredom because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do in his boredom he was smitten and he knew that Uriah was off doing exactly what he should have been doing he was at war for David and so David called for Bathsheba and the result of their rendezvous was that Bathsheba fell pregnant and David started trying to cover it up and the ensuing cover up ended in Uriah's death the two were ultimately married there were whispers but you know the truth is it appeared that David had gotten away with it but God didn't miss anything the scripture says what David did was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so just like Samuel went to Saul to confront him. God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David for his sin. And you know what David did? He didn't spin it. He didn't try to manage it. He owned it. The whole sordid affair. He mourned it. Psalm 51 is a song that David wrote. In response to this visit from Nathan. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to look. We're going to look at a couple of these verses very quickly. And I'm finished. Here's what David said in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1. 
He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Look, here's what, here's the truth. Managing sin means that we focus on ourselves and how sin affects us, but mourning sin turns the focus to God. David understood immediately that it was against God and God alone that he sinned. Yes, there were devastating consequences to David's sin throughout the land of Israel, but it was God's glory that he denigrated by sin. When we acknowledge sin as sin and we quit trying to manage it, God steps in and offers us comfort. David went on to say in 51.10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't, Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know what David understood? Same thing we need to understand. The truth. The wages of sin is death. The mournful loss of those things that we should truly treasure But God offers us salvation from that death through the forgiveness of our sins. A gift of His grace that we don't deserve. He forgives us. He comforts us. And then He sustains us. So we can live in the joy of not our salvation, His salvation. His salvation. You know what God knows beyond a shadow of a doubt? We don't get it all right. Like we are all of us sinners. In desperate need of God's grace and mercy. And He desperately wants to provide it. The kingdom of God is open to those who mourn. It was opened by Christ. And we receive it through faith in Him. If if you're not a believer... Listen, hear hear me and understand this. God isn't saying mourn, 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 stay there. God is saying to mourn the devastating effects of sin just to acknowledge it as a reality. Sin on the outside and sin on the inside. And then he says, if you'll turn to Jesus and place your faith in him, you can be set free. And enjoy the abundant life that Jesus died to provide. If you are a believer and your relationship with God seems to be slipping away or maybe it just has very little pulse, then you might need to pray that prayer of David, search me, O God, and try my heart. See if there be any offensive way in me and then lead me to the way everlasting. Lord, Show me what's dark. Show me the sin and I'll confess it. I'm going to stop trying to manage it. I'm going to stop writing it off as mistakes. 
Help me mourn it. Consider, confess, and mourn your sin. And God will comfort you. And God will restore to you the joy of his salvation. Let's pray. First, if you're, if you're not a believer, I just want to address, your, address you just for a moment. Our sin keeps us from living the life we've always wanted. Sin is it's, it's real for all of us. It's, it's sin that took Jesus to the cross and your sin can be forgiven by faith in Him. There is true joy and victory in His salvation and we access His salvation by asking Him to be the Lord of our lives. We believe the good news that He died on the cross, was raised from the dead, that we can be saved. If you believe that and you welcome that truth in your heart, you'll be transitioned from the lost, from darkness to light. From held captive by sin to set free. There is no better choice you'll ever make. And today can be the day of your salvation. And if you're a believer, I challenge you to be honest. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for pointing out the benefits of mourning the sin you died to forgive. To give us the courage to do so. Father, for those who don't know you who haven't come to faith in you I pray that today might be the day of their salvation as they embrace your salvation and for those of us who do Lord I pray that we will have the courage to be real acknowledging the darkness in our hearts so you can bring light it's in Christ's name I pray Amen